In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, Tetrarch of the region of Eturia and Trachonitis, and Licinius was Tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the desert. John went through the whole region of the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the words of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying out in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The winding roads will be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Hello and welcome to Closer Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father Bayer, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. A voice crying out in the desert, prepare you the way of the Lord. John the Baptist. Interesting. Interesting. And we know the whole story that when uh, Mary went to visit her kinswoman, Elizabeth, and when she went to uh, visit her, she says, the, the moment your voice sounded in my ear, the child within my womb leapt for joy. That child was to become John the Baptist. And almost in utero, if you will, John the Baptist recognized the Savior of the world. And we know the whole story because his father, Zechariah, didn't know about the pregnancy, and he was struck mute when he questioned, and he was mute when the baby was born, and when they asked him what the name would be, and, you know, Elizabeth said, John, and he said, no, no one in your family has that name, and then they asked Zechariah, and he put John as his name. Then his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak. But John the Baptist, who recognized the Lord since before his birth, was the one that was chosen to be the precursor, the one who was to, to tell the coming of the Son of Man. Interesting. What we know from the Scriptures John the Baptist was a pretty strange fellow. He lived in the desert. He wore camel hair and a leather belt. Not exactly the dress of the day. He ate wild locusts and drank honey. And so John the Baptist, in the time of our Lord, would have been someone that we see on city streets and they're talking about salvation, they're talking about repentance, and they're talking about when I was a kid, we used to cross the Mississippi River on a ferry and there was an old man there who was willing to baptize anyone who wanted to come to be baptized in the Mississippi River. And the locals laughed and called him John the Baptist and everything like that. And if he wasn't baptized and he was preaching, and no one really paid much attention to him. They thought he was, you know, a quart low when it came to intelligence and that sort of thing. And we've all seen him. In my local town, I've got a guy that is a very, very avid pro-life advocate really lives each and every day, you know, to, to defend the dignity of life. 
but he comes across as a little strange, dressed a little weird. You'll see him on a main thoroughfare walking down the street carrying a crucifix or a cross on his arms and everything. This guy's a little weird. Uh, that's John the Baptist that the people looked at and said, this, you know, this guy's not, you know, doesn't have all 52 cards in that deck. So anyway, you ask yourself why. He's the son of God. Why didn't he get Pontius Pilate to proclaim him or Philip or Lysanias or Annas or Caiaphas, a high priest? If they would have said it, then everyone would have believed it because of their position. And that becomes a question about how does God reveal his presence in the world? Are we really looking? Are we really looking for the rich and the powerful and the mighty to bring God's presence into the world? Or is it through the simple? Is it through the offbeat? Is it through the humble? Is it through the lowly? To me, you know, case in point, Mother Teresa, who would have ever thought? I knew her. And she literally about that tall. She's about as tall standing as I am sitting. And she was Albanian from Skopje. She moves to Calcutta. And at the time, the practice was people were put out of the house to die on the street. And after teaching at an exclusive girls' school, as exclusive as they get in Calcutta, she decided she couldn't walk past people dying on the street. She had to do something. She defines it as a call within a call. So she moves into the slum. And, and, and when I say slum, I know the slums of Calcutta. It wasn't a bad housing project. It was a piece of tin and a piece of plastic, okay? And it was dirt. And there was mud everywhere. And she starts picking up people who are dying. Some of her students thought it was wonderful and came. And they started to help her. Well, we all know the story that she got made famous by uh, an article by Malcolm Muggeridge. And then Mother Teresa became a worldwide phenomenon. What was amazing to me was, first of all, she was anything but glamorous. She was anything but powerful. And she was very, very humble and slight. First time I met her, flying to Calcutta, I get to the rectory where I'm staying. I go to the house, to the uh, mother house, and I I'm in the chapel which is on the second story. And I'm, I'm doing holy hour. And one of the nuns, Sister Priscilla, comes and says, Mother's here, would like to meet you. Little old bitty thing. We're up on this breezeway type of thing. I walk up and I grab her hand. And I said, oh, Mother, it's such a pleasure to meet you. She kissed my hand. And she said, you're our gift from God. Our chaplain left yesterday. So you'll be our chaplain. I'm standing there with Mother Teresa, who kisses my hand because I'm a priest, and tells me I'm the gift from God. And I think to myself, tell me what's wrong with this picture. You know, I'm standing in the presence of a saint, and I'm the gift from God? The point is this, that her nothingness became her greatness. In the, I think, late 80s, there's some women's magazine, and you'll be happy to know I don't read women's magazines, but uh, they proclaimed Mother Teresa as the most admired woman in the world. 
She's a nobody. She lives in the slums. She has an extra habit, and she didn't even have an extra pair of sandals. And she's the most admired woman in the world who on any day of her life didn't have two nickels to rub together. But she was the most admired in the world. And so you start to understand the question of the nothingness or the offbeatness, if you will, of John the Baptist and why he proclaimed he was sent to proclaim the presence of Christ in the world. Because it's not through the ordinary and the rich and the powerful were that the case our Lord would have been born as a king. He was the king of the universe. He never wore a crown except for thorns. He was not elevated in any position of power other than his position to love and to forgive sins and to heal and to restore. That was his power, not political power. And yet, it's in that that John the Baptist proclaimed his coming. How many times have we said, out of the mouth of babes, out of the mouth of babes, kids have asked us an obvious question that they were right. Oh, that's okay, honey, when you grow up, you'll understand, you know, no, I'm not going to understand. You know, how come you don't like those people? How come you treat them differently? How come you say those things about them? The kid's right. And out of the mouth of babes. And that is an opportunity for us and our nothingness to bring Christ's presence to the world. How many times do we find ourselves in the company of friends, family, or loved ones, and we choose not to say anything because we don't want to hurt their feelings? I'll never forget high school, girls that I knew, friends of mine. I didn't know they, they had taken one of their friends to get an abortion. And our friend confided in me, God, we felt so bad. We were coming home, and she was so depressed, she was so upset, and we were trying to cheer her up. And I, I just instinctively said, why? She just killed the baby. Why should she be happy? And the girl looked at me like, why do you tell me that? I said, because it's true. That's what just happened. Why should we have a fun time coming home and a, and a child's life has just been taken? How many times in the midst of all the things that are going on today, people are talking about what they believe in, how we ought to do, how we ought to do that, and we just shut up. You know, I don't want to get in an argument. I don't want to upset anybody. So I'm going to be quiet and I'm going to silence the voice of God in the world in which I live. Thank God John the Baptist was not silent. We'll be back in a moment. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bay from Closer Walk Catholic Communications. Thank you for being here today, and a special thanks for the support that you give us. First of all, your prayerful support we so desperately need, and also your financial support. We are donor-driven, and that would is what keeps us on the air today. As you well know, the truth is in great demand and in very short supply, and mainstream media is not gonna bring you the truth of the gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's not socially acceptable and it's not politically correct. Certainly we all realize that when this life journey's over, we don't stand before the Supreme Court, we stand before the throne of God. Therefore, with great clarity and great charity, to pronounce the truth of the gospel is important. Your prayers, your financial support enables us to do that. So we thank you and may God bring you closer in your walk with the Lord each day. 
God bless you. John went out the whole region of the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance as is written in the book of the prophet Isaiah. A voice cries out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The winding roads made straight and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of our God. Hello and Welcome back to Close to Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father Byer, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. There was a voice crying out in the desert, make straight the way of the Lord. Where are the voices? Where are the voices? Not where are the laws. Not where is the next election. Not where is the next global summit. Where are the voices? I want to ask, if I were a parent and I had my children in the public school system and the public school system was promoting critical race theory, <coughs> that is, is telling certain races that they're the preferred race and the other race is either less or the oppressor or not as good. I grew up in the 60s. It was radical back then to have friends who were other races. But that's what we did. That's what we fought for. That's what we wanted everybody to know, that it doesn't matter. People are people. They're good. They're bad. I prefer the good. I avoid the bad. I don't care what color the good are. I don't care what color the bad are. I make my choice based on, as Dr. Martin Luther King would say, the content of their character and not the color of their skin. <clears throat> That's something that we work very, very hard to try to bring about. And there were some laws that helped that. And now you're telling what would be my grandchildren, that critical race theory, where are the voices? Where are the voices crying out and going to the school board and say, listen, I don't want this for my children. I don't want my children to be introduced to transgender storytelling in the library. I don't want that. I'm going to love and respect a person who happens to be transgender I don't want it promoted to my kids. I'm going to love and respect a person who has the same sex attraction. I don't want it promoted to my kid. Where are the voice crying out to protect the next generation? As you may know, I run a shelter for juvenile victims of human trafficking. It's a victim that I have five wonderful nuns who live in the shelter with the girls. It's a 16 bed facility and live with the girls and become the mothers a lot of these children never had. And of course you can well imagine this will be a very expensive undertaking and it is. So I applied to the Department of Justice, who takes care of everything in this country and the funding to see if I would qualify for some federal funds 
to, you know, provide for these children. I had two questions. The first question was, do, will you abide by the government's definition of women's health care? Not really. I'm not going to save one and kill another. Well, then let me ask you, if someone who's anatomically male but self-identifies as a female and has been trafficked and would like to come to your, your shelter, will you allow this person in your shelter? Oh, that's an easy one. Not no, but hell no. I'm going to let children, some as young as 11, who've been traumatized by men, live next door to an anatomically correct male. Not going to happen. Well, then you're not inclusive. You do not, you do not qualify for any federal funding because I'm not inclusive. Where are the voices? Where are the voices crying out? Saying there's really something wrong with that. Inclusive doesn't mean anything goes with anyone at any time and everywhere. Inclusive means we ought to be able to have a group of people that we serve, that we love, that we care for. And this John the Baptist voice crying out in the wilderness, these are questions that really happen today. Where are the voices crying out and saying, I don't care what you tear down, you can't erase history. And the reality is, is unless we remember our history and study our history, we're destined to repeat it. And so there are many things in our history that we're not very proud of. And the reality is, is that these statues don't change that history one bit. And taking someone who is a career criminal and putting up a new statue doesn't change one bit the people who are victims of his crime. But somehow... The voices have been silenced. Why? Because someone may turn off the television, call Catholic TV in Boston, and tell them, how can you have this racist priest on there who doesn't embrace critical race theory? And everyone is going to start using names and become very intolerant of someone else's opinion, and they're going to force people through media and through social media and through the Internet to call people racist or homophobic or whatever you want to call them, and we silence the voices. That's what John the Baptist refused to do, to be silenced. He refused to speak about the, the one who's coming after me, who's baptized you in the Holy Spirit, who's greater than I, whose sandals I'm not even fit to unfasten. He wasn't going to be silenced. We have allowed ourselves in today's society to be silenced. We know the truth, but we're afraid to speak the truth because someone is going to silence us. I'm telling you, these people in same-sex relationship, God loves them as much as he loves me. And God calls them to himself as much as he calls me to himself. And same thing with any other race, group, creed, belief. We're made in the image and likeness of the same God. But that doesn't change the truth 
And the fact that people disagree and are easily silenced and intimidated about the truth doesn't relieve us of the responsibility of speaking the truth. The purpose of the church is to proclaim Christ's message of salvation of all people. And regardless of what choices you've made, that doesn't eliminate you from the salvation nor the invitation from Almighty God to come to Him. But it doesn't relieve us because things are different to refrain from the truth, to keep silent about the truth. Because the people who are promoting those things that are contrary to the law of God, they get louder and they get louder and they get more aggressive and we shut up. With great clarity and great charity, we're called to proclaim the truth. We're not called to pass out tickets to heaven or hell. That's none of our responsibilities. But we, like John the Baptist, are called to proclaim the truth of the Gospels and the truth of proclaiming Christ here on earth. And when people oppose that truth, and when people intimidate you for that truth, to silence us is to deny God. And there will come a time when proclaiming the truth is no longer acceptable when enough of us remain silent, then the truth will be silenced. We can't let it happen. John the Baptist proclaimed the coming of Christ and proclaimed the salvation of Christ. We are falling down on the job if we refuse to proclaim the truth for fear that someone may not feel comfortable with it. There are so many things that are promoted in today's society I don't feel comfortable with. That doesn't keep people from proclaiming it and trying to push it down our throat. Great clarity, great charity, proclaim the truth of the gospel and the salvation event. John the Baptist did it. It eventually led to his head being on a platter. We can't let the same thing happen, and we can't let the voice of God and the truth of the Gospels to be silenced. Thank you for being with us. May each day bring you closer in your walk with the Lord. God bless.